Welcome back to Harbour Unboxed. For today's video, we're going to revisit Intel's Core i5 7600K. This is the last four core, four threaded i5 processor. It was released back in January of 2017 for $240 US. It's a pretty crazy price looking back, but of course it was a very different time for desktop CPUs. Today, you can get something like the Ryzen 7 3700X for about $30 more, and that offers twice as many cores and four times more threads. And while you might expect that kind of improvement over a three and a half year period, the six years predating the 7600K saw nothing but quad cores pad out the entire Intel Core i5 range. Incredibly, the Core i5 2500K is almost a decade old at this point, and it too sold for a little over $200 US way back in 2011. Today though, Intel no longer offers a four core, four thread desktop processor. Even the 10th gen Core i3 range features SMT support for four cores, eight threads. The eighth and ninth generation of Core i3s did feature a four core, four thread configuration, but that now appears to be a thing of the past for Intel's core series. So it's gonna be very interesting to see how the Core i5-7600K handles our modern suite of benchmarks and how it compares to the Ryzen 5 1600. The six core 12 thread Ryzen processor arrived just months after the release of the 7600K and at roughly the same price offered considerably more CPU resources. But despite packing more cores, SMT support and a much larger cache, it was highly debatable as to which of these two CPUs was the best buy back in 2017. For core heavy workloads, the R5 1600 was much faster and in many instances even beat the Core i7 7700K. For lightly threaded workloads though, the 7600K generally came out well on top thanks to its higher operating frequency and lower latency interconnect. But when it came to gaming benchmarks, the Ryzen 5 1600 was a mixed bag to say the least. And of course, this applied to all first gen Ryzen processors. Depending on the game, the Ryzen processor could match and even sometimes beat the 7600K. And this was seen in titles such as Ashes of the Singularity and Battlefield 1. But there were many, many more instances where it was noticeably slower. And for this reason, many gamers went with the Core i5 7600K. Anyway, enough talking about past benchmarks, it's now time to see how the 7600K handles in 2020. The 7th Gen Core processors have been tested on the ASRock Z270 Tai Chi motherboard, the 8th and 9th Gen processors were tested on the Gigabyte Z390 Aorus Ultra, and the new 10th Gen Intel Core processors on the ASUS ROG Maximus 12 Extreme. Oh, and then we have the Ryzen processors, they've all been tested on the Gigabyte X570 Aorus Master. Finally, all configurations used the GeForce RTX 2080 Ti, 32 GB of DDR4-3200CL14 memory, and a Corsair Hydro Series H150i Pro 360mm all-in-one liquid cooler. Okay, so with all that out of the way, let's get into the results. As usual, we'll start with the productivity benchmarks and then move into the gaming tests. First up, we have Cinebench R20, and back in early 2017, the score we see here with the 7600K would have been fairly high for a desktop CPU. Of course, Cinebench R20 wasn't a thing back then, we were using R15 at the time, but the point is, the level of performance seen here would have been considered excellent just three years ago. Today though, the 7600K isn't even at the level of a modern Core i3 processor, and in fact, even when overclocked to 4.9 gigahertz, the Core i3-10100 was 16% faster. You can clearly see why Intel was forced into adding more cores when we look at the stock R5-1600 as it's seen to be 32% faster than the overclocked 7600K, while it's over 50% faster when comparing the stock results. However, the results do swing massively in the other direction for single core workloads. Here the Ryzen 5 1600 is very slow, and as a result the stock 7600K is almost 30% faster. Of course, you can improve the R5 1600 via overclocking, but that's not really the focus of this video. Again, we're primarily looking at the 7600K and how it compares to modern processors. The OC results are just there for reference. Here's a look at compression performance with the 7-zip file manager. Again, when compared to the modern processors, the productivity performance of the 7600K is pretty dismal. If we look at stock performance, we find the Ryzen 5 1600 is over 60% faster here, and even the new Core i3-10100 offers a 34% performance boost. And things get even worse for the 7600K when it comes to decompression performance, as SMT technology is much better leveraged. Now the Core i3-10100 is 36% faster, and the Ryzen 5 1600, quite incredibly, is 91% faster. 
Next up, we have Blender, and it's crazy to see that just three years ago, amateur 3D modeling artists were very limited in terms of CPU power. $240 US really didn't get you much. And here we're seeing that the Ryzen 5 1600 actually reduced the render time by 41%, and that is a massive time saver. However, today with the Ryzen 5 3600 and Core i5-10600K, you're looking at well over a 50% time saving. The same also applies to code compilation work. What once took just shy of five hours with the Core i5-7600K can now be done in around two hours with the Ryzen 5 3600 and Core i5-10600K. AMD really set the wheels in motion for this kind of progress with the R5-1600, reducing the five hour completion time with the 7600K to just three hours. As for video production work, the 7600K isn't really comparable with any of the modern processors. Again, the Core i3-10100, for example, that was 21% faster, while the Ryzen 5 1600 is 26% faster, and then the more modern $200 options are around 50% faster. So again, massive progress has been made at this price point. And here's a quick look at the Adobe Premiere performance. Again, even the Core i3-10100 is a good bit faster than the 7600K, this time boosting performance by 28%. And we're also seeing a 47% performance boost with the Ryzen 5 1600, and then a rather massive 85% boost with the R5-3600. It is well worth noting though, that not all applications have adapted to take advantage of core heavy processors. And a good example of this is Adobe Photoshop. Here the 7600K is actually faster than the Ryzen 5 1600, albeit by just a 5% margin. And we do see when compared to modern processors like the R5 3600, we're still looking at a rather substantial 33% performance uplift. Another application that doesn't utilize core heavy processors very well is Adobe After Effects. Again, the stock 7600K is marginally faster than the R5 1600, but you're still looking at a reasonable performance gain with the more modern processors such as the R5 3600 and Core i5 10600K. An area where Intel has done very well is in optimizing their architecture's power consumption. This has allowed them to rule the mobile market, though that does appear to be coming to an end. Anyway, the 7600K pushed total system consumption to just 117 watts, and that's a 39 watt saving when compared to the Ryzen 5 1600, though it does feature 33% fewer cores. I think it's fair to say though, given that the total system consumption is well under 200 watts for both options, power consumption really wasn't an issue for either CPU. Okay, so it's time to move on to gaming. And first up we have the Battlefield 5 benchmark at 1080p using the ultra quality preset, again with an RTX 2080 Ti. Here we're seeing very similar results to that of our Battlefield 1 testing conducted back in 2017. Basically, the 7600K is quite a bit faster than the Ryzen 5 1600 when it comes to the average frame rate performance, and here we're seeing a 12% increase. However, if we look at the all-important 1% low data, the R5 1600 is actually 35% faster, and even overclocking the 7600K can't save it here. So while the 7600K does appear very fast when spot checking the FPS counter, the actual gaming experience is rather poor, suffering from frequent frame stuttering. A game that doesn't require more than four cores is Far Cry New Dawn, and here the Core i5-7600K trounces the Ryzen 5 1600, beating it by a very convincing 25% margin. Games like Far Cry New Dawn were always an issue for Ryzen early on. Third gen Ryzen went a long way in solving this issue, but even so, the 7600K still does well, even compared to the more modern processors. Gears Tactics is another example where first gen Ryzen really doesn't do very well, and as a result, the 7600K is considerably faster, rendering almost 20% more frames on average when compared to the Ryzen 5 1600. And I should also note that CPU utilization is very low in this title, so the experience is good with the 7600K. That said, modern options such as the Core i5-10600K are significantly faster, and here we're talking about a 33% performance increase. Another game that doesn't heavily utilize the CPU is Ghost Recon Breakpoint, and as a result, the four core, four thread processors work just fine. That said, we are still seeing comparable performance between the 7600K and R5-1600. Moving on, here's a game that is very CPU demanding, Shadow of the Tomb Raider, and please note we aren't using the built-in benchmark. In this title, the 7600K suffers from noticeable stuttering, with 1% lows dropping below 60fps at 1080p using an RTX 2080 Ti. And this means that stock, the Ryzen 5, was quite incredibly 39% faster. That is a huge performance uplift, and you can expect to see more margins like this moving forward. 
Red Dead Redemption 2 is the last game we're going to look at, and it is another fairly demanding title. Though here the 7600K fares a little better, as it is able to match the Ryzen 5 1600. That said, newer processors such as the R5 3600 are 24% faster, and we see a rather big 36% performance uplift with the Core i5 10600K. Okay, so that's all the benchmark graphs we have. It's time to wrap this one up. And I've got to say, once again, it is just crazy to see how far we've come over the past few years. And if we look back at parts such as the Core i5-6600K, which really that's just been rebranded as the 7600K. So the 6600K was released five years ago, back in 2015. And at the time, I think it's fair to say it really was everyone's best value gaming CPU. And it maintained that claim throughout 2016 until it was rebranded as the 7600K in 2017. And that rebranding saw a bit of a clock frequency increase. And of course, Intel kept the same 200-ish well, $240 price tag. So as I've said a few times now, as recent as three years ago, roughly $240 US bought you nothing more than a quad core without SMT support from Intel. And then prior to anything Ryzen, uh, AMD only offered those awful FX processors. So I guess you could blame Intel for milking consumers over the past decade, or you could blame AMD for bungling their previous architecture so badly that it meant Intel could compete with their Core i3 range. Either way, things are a lot better now, and it is great to look back and see how far CPUs have come in a relatively short time. I mean, three years is nothing when you consider the fact that little progress was made during the six years between 2011 and 2017. And not to beat up on the 7600K, but it's just really not a Core i5 part that we look back on too fondly, like we would with, say, the 2500K, for example. Six generations of four-core, four-thread Core i5 processors was about three generations too many, especially without any significant IPC gains. Today, the Core i5-7600K wouldn't even compete as a budget processor. It's entry-level material at best, a sub $100 offering. That said, they do still regularly sell secondhand for around $130 to $150 US, as people view them as a quick and easy upgrade option for an old cheap OEM system running a dual-core Core i3, for example. It is madness, but I guess if you bought a 7600K and you want to ditch it for something better, the strong resale value is a big plus, so at least there's that. It's worth noting though that for a good number of games, the 7600K is still sufficient and will actually deliver a rather impressive gaming experience. Popular titles such as CSGO, League of Legends, Fortnite, Rocket League, and many, many more play just fine with a quad core that can clock up to around 4 gigahertz. Where it falls apart, are in newer, more demanding games, such as Shadow of the Tomb Raider and Battlefield 5, for example, and I suspect moving forward there'll be more games added to that list. Anyway, that is going to do it for this one. If you enjoyed the video, you know what to do. One of those things. Uh, subscribe for more content. I will have a Core i7-7700K revisit coming up on the channel soon, and of course we have a whole heap of other content coming as well, as we usually churn out at least five videos per week. Uh, if you'd like to get more involved with the channel, support us over on Patreon and allows us to buy hardware and do testing that isn't supported by the manufacturers and various companies that are involved with this sort of stuff. So yeah, that's pretty cool. You also get some good perks in return. Discord chat, monthly live stream, which is always a lot of fun. Q and A's, behind the scenes videos, all that stuff. So yeah, as I said, if you're interested, link is in the video description. But other than all of that, I would just like to thank you for watching the video, especially if you watched all of it and you became part of the 20% club. Good stuff. And yeah, I'm, I'm your host, Steve. Thank you for watching.